Thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar, Supply Chain Pivots, Overcoming Disruptions, presented by Oracle NetSuite. My name is Michael Valello. I am the Executive Vice President for Strategic Communications and Marketing. I'm also the WSWA Access Craft Director. I also want to thank WSWA's Access Craft Wholesale Advisory Board, made up of expert wine and spirits craft distribution experts and some of the very special craft brand representatives to our building. Um, so some of the most exciting brands in small production craft and startup marketplace. We also want to thank WSWA's board of directors for their support. Today, I am very excited to join, uh, be joined by a panel of experts who will share proven business pivots that are enabling their teams, manage brands and customers to overcome supply chain issues with short and long-term solutions. Unprecedented challenges impacting the availability of glass bottles, corks and caps, and other disruptions plaguing the industry have become an enormous challenge for operations. So today we'll explore some of those day-to-day -day supply chain steps, as well as complete overhauls to mitigate supply chain impacts. And uh, we'll look to, to make this a part of another excellent webinar uh, brought to you by WCWA Access Craft. This webinar will, re will be recorded and made available at wswa.org forward slash access craft along with follow-up materials. All right, let's get started. So these are unprecedented times. And so for the next hour or so, we hope to bring you solutions to navigate this new and exciting marketplace. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Clara Alleman with National Accounts Manager with Amphora International. Clara, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We have Nick Ledick of uh, Hotel Tango Distillery. Nick's the president there. Nick, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Peter Lajewski, uh, Vice President of Supply Chain, Breakthrough Beverage Group. Peter, good to see you. Thanks, Michael. All right, we're going to start off with uh, a question for Nick. Um, Nick, you're in the thick of it as an emerging brand. I mean, Hotel Tango's products, a veteran-owned and operated brand, is blazing a trail. Tell us about your brand's growth trajectory, as well as some of the disruptions you've experienced. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'll give the quick backstory and then talk about some of the, the disruptions we may have uh, experienced or avoided. Um, Hotel Tango was started by my friend Travis in 2014 in downtown Indianapolis. That's where we're headquartered out of. Uh, we've grown from the single tasting room in Indiana to three tasting rooms, one of which I'm sitting in today. So excuse me if any deliveries show up or something. Um, and then uh, we grew the distribution side of our business from about 706 packs in sales that first year to being on pace for over 40,000 this year um, from 2014 to 2022. So that obviously has not come without its challenges. Um, many have been self-inflicted and growing pains uh, from taking a small brand to, you know, medium to getting closer to larger. And then a lot of them uh, were unprecedented times over the last two years. So. Um, our footprint, we cover about 25 states now, and we're in 120 military bases. So we've tried as we've grown to mirror our civilian footprint to our military one. So outside of our Midwest, which is kind of our sweet spot, we've been working on the East Coast and Florida and Texas and some of those uh, markets with higher military concentration. And uh, that's really helped us um, connect with some consumers there and find a home for the brand. So uh, the majority of what we do is whiskey. Um, but we do have uh, 10 spirits now in our portfolio. So um, we've experienced, I feel like the gamut, uh, everything from uh, you know labels not showing up in time, which delays a special release or a single barrel, uh, you know, or just having some peeling issues and really the quality control side of it. Uh, we've definitely experienced stuff with corks. Uh, more recently, uh, not unique to us, you know, there's potentially barrel shortages for people that are putting liquid into barrels. Um, and making sure that those supplies are locked up. Uh, with some of our wholesalers, we've had uh, trucking issues as of late, just honestly the, the logistics industry having uh, drivers and availability. Um, so that's caused some uh, delays as far as picking up or logistical kind of concerns, but um, really the biggest one and uh, kind of the catalyst for maybe being asked to be on the panel today for us was uh, a big disruption that we narrowly avoided in moving our glass for our brand uh, from produced overseas in Italy, we were sourcing it from Vetro. And then when we did a rebrand in 2019, we went to a custom mold and were able to find a great partner in Indiana in Lawrenceburg an anchor glass company. 
and we're able to get our bottles produced stateside and our mold, which really locked up the supply and the future availability of those. Um, we were making that shift really pre pandemic. Uh, so like I said, I, uh, we sort of uh, hit the sweet spot as far as timing goes, because right when we were waiting on our last uh, trailers of uh, Vetro produced Italian bottles to come over, those was that was right when everything was getting stuck in port and the wait times were TBD and we didn't know. And so we were trying to uh, make worst case scenario plans if we had to turn one of our products off to keep one of our faster moving ones growing. But uh, luckily, uh, we we threaded the needle and we started getting glass produced in Indiana. Uh, and that's been a wonderful partnership and really helped shore up a lot of our uh, one of the biggest, um, you know, supply chain disruptions that's hit the wine and spirits industry, which is, you know, glass and being able to really get anything overseas and a lot of this logistical worldwide supply chain challenges. So uh, that was the, the biggest uh, relief for us. And uh, we're really proud now of what we have and it makes our ability to receive smaller amounts and control our own destiny from a glass side a lot more manageable. Yeah, those are some significant pivots that you seem to have taken and navigated this, uh, I think, with some success. So congratulations to you and that entire Hotel Tangled team. Peter, let's go to you. You work with a lot of wine spirits brands at Breakthrough. Based upon what Nick just shared, what are your thoughts on these challenges? How are these supply chain problems disproportionately affecting emerging startup and craft brands? Yeah, yeah sure, exactly. And, and uh, you know, again, thanks for having me. And I do I tip my cap to all of you out there. You know, as entrepreneurs and uh, startup managers, remember, if you can steer through this, uh, there are better days ahead. Uh, but but certainly, you know, it, it's a difficult time. And as a, a smaller supplier, you know, you really need to look, think about you know what I refer to as the economies of small, because as a distributor, what do we need? We, you know, we're excited about your product. We want to take it to market. And what we don't want to have happen is there's a great level of excitement. We get all the placements we've hoped for, and then we can't sustain the supply. And that may be despite every effort possible that you've put into it, but for some of the reasons Nick mentioned, whether it's capacity at a glass plant, whether it's transportation, whether it's the ocean, or heck, we've all just experienced labor strikes as well. Um, and we, now we can't get it. And, and so really the key is how as a small supplier do you prepare you know to be to be flexible um, and i think there are there are a number of things that you know i would encourage people to look at is you know number one so many people i have i have my own brand right and you want to differentiate and sometimes we can do that through glass but the the one of the key things i would encourage people is to not do that differentiate through decoration Choose a bottle that, you know, whether you want to use, um, you know, some of the popular terms, you know, as fungible or scalable or what we may have called generic at one point, meaning, you know, a round bottle. Okay. There's nothing the matter with that. Uh, what's great about that is there are numerous sources, numerous people around the world, numerous people in the United States, and quite frankly, um, if somebody else's brand isn't doing well, somebody may have excess inventory that, that could land in your lap. So, you know, avoiding some of that customization in that primary container and using secondary decoration to differentiate um, would be a very key thing that I would uh, encourage people to do. Um, likewise, you know, I would avoid getting into custom colors. The, the spirits business you know, what we call, what we look at as clear glass, we refer to it as flint. Flint glass is always available for spirits containers. Likewise in wine, you have the flint and you have champagne green. When we get into cobalt blues and we get into, uh, you know, some of these sea colors, uh, they're only produced once a year, maybe sometimes twice a year. And if all of a sudden you're having the success you all dream of and the success we want you to have as your distributor, um, now the glass isn't available. So now you're into how fast can I respond and the consumer sees something different and they're not sure what it is. And that can all cause disruption at the, at the shelf level or at the uh, on-premise level, which can then cause other confusion for you. So, so my message is, you know, keep it simple, you know, come out of the gate, look, look to differentiate through decoration um, and use as many standard containers closures, et cetera, uh, as possible. 
Yeah, so it's not just about avoiding the physical disruptions of supply not being there, but actually the brand recall disruptions where the consumer may not recognize or um, you know, align with the product. So that's really interesting from a perception standpoint. Uh, Claire, let's let's go to you. You know, Anfor is a provider to so many great brands, from the beautiful ceramic bottles for Como Tequila. I have one of those bottles right here. Uh, just here. Beautiful, <clears throat> yeah, and the and the blues, um, which makes Peter smile, and uh, also Heaven's Doors and and many other uh, products. What types of products have been the most impacted by the recent supply chain issues? Well, as Nick and Peter both said, glass, of course. Um, but also ceramic. I mean, to be honest, from the very beginning, we started to have issues getting clay additives, getting plaster um, that really put a strain on production. And so uh, what we did is we leaned heavily on our relationships with other suppliers. We have a supplier of clay in Indiana that really worked with us, Indiana and Kentucky, that really worked with us to um, come up with a product that we could use in place of the product we couldn't get. So um, definitely clay, uh, cork, of course, has been an issue. We've had a lot, had to switch a lot of customers from synthetic to natural cork. And so cork, clay, and especially right now, I would say the pigments for decorating, for glaze, um, decorating, especially um, the cobalt blue for the Comos bottle. So what we've done is where normally we'd order 15 days out, now we're ordering three months out for gold pigment as well. And so it's really about just being flexible and you know, we're warehousing and absorbing a lot of the costs of you know, ordering ahead. So I would say those have been the big ones. And now uh, with everything that's going on in Ukraine, that was actually one of our biggest clay suppliers. So we can't get that Ukrainian clay anymore. So again, we're going back to our partners in the US, Kentucky and Indiana and leaning on them to help fill the, the fill the gap, bridge the gap. So those would be the big ones. And of course, labor uh, all the way across the industry. Yeah, from the pandemic to, uh, to, to global conflict, there's lots of disruptions yeah. in the industry. And it seems like your job has evolved, not just from taking orders and fulfilling those orders, but you've really become a consultant. I think that's what's been critical for and for to be a, a trusted partner and supplier uh, to a lot of these, these big brands. So um, I think people yeah. really appreciate that and expect that. Yeah, um, it's all about being being transparent and helping the customer find a solution. So, yeah, and a, and a follow up question for you, Clara: mm -hmm. um, What products in the Afora portfolio are the most resilient, and and what have clients really been drawn to, uh, given what we've learned over the last two and a half years? I would say, um, sorry about this, Peter, but I would say the custom bottles um, specifically, because it allows them to um, uh, let's see here, it allows them to be like we're very flexible, we adapt, we have designers in house and, um, you know, cash is tight right now. Everybody, you know, doesn't have a lot to spend. And so our MOQs are low, our design fees are low. So I, I really think that the ceramic bottles in general have been pretty resilient uh, just to, to keep the brands going and to, just offer a point of differentiation because everything right now is about premiumization in the industry. And that's really what we offer is just another level for the bottles. Yeah, makes sense. Peter, um, building off that, what are some of the best practices for brands when it comes to ordering product materials, um, everything from glass to corks and, and other materials to complete the product? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I would tell you the most important thing anybody you know can do and I would tell you to literally start this afternoon is really sit down and understand what your requirements are what are your projections both your short term and your long term because again as capacity becomes available whether it's at a glass plant or inventory becomes available somewhere people are going to call and they're going to need your projections right away you know so you need to look at have those available have them ready not let me sit down and work it out. I'll get back to you. But but in any advanced planning, Clara mentions the lead time on gold pigment. You know, so to know that you may need, let's see, this is uh, you know mid July that you may need containers in September, October, November. You know, as she's placing orders for her materials now, okay, she can make sure that those requirements um, are built in. Likewise, if a if a glass producer knows that they are going to be 
you know, running a particular mold. If they already have your requirements as opposed to you calling up and saying, do you have? And whether you're working with a distributor or directly with a glass company, these are, these are both very important things uh, to do. Uh, so th that, that's like immediately what should we be looking at? Uh, the other thing is there are various uh, forms of information available about shipping. And I would, you, you probably know what your supplier's lead times are, but if you're bringing something in from Europe, you know, monitor what's going on with, uh, with ocean freight. You know, right now things have gotten a little bit better coming out of Europe. Uh, but that could turn around on a moment's notice. Uh, and of course, now we're going into the August shutdown. So, you know, have we, have you managed around those August shutdowns and are you prepared? So I, I would, I would encourage people to really look at the logistics of what it takes to get the product from your supplier into your shop uh, as, as much as I would encourage you to look at the physical component, whether it's a glass closure or you know, like, like with Clara, you're, you're, if you're using a decorator, what are their lead times and what are their, what are their capacity limitations? Yeah, and Peter, just to, to a follow up to that question, what role does a distributor play in that? Because well, just like with, with Clara's business, Clara's become much more of a consultant and a solution provider and you know, giving people updates seems like on a, on a daily basis, a lot more communication. Mm -hmm. What role does a wholesaler play in helping these brands navigate these challenges and you know, sharing information uh, as, as you learn it. Sure, uh, the, yeah, your wholesaler, your distributor, they have, you know, and I, now I'm talking about the packaging wholesaler and packaging distributor. Uh, they, are, they are usually in primary communication, you know, say with the large glass producers, you know, the Ardaws, the Owens, you know, et cetera, of the world. Um, they are also in touch with, you know, closure companies. and. Many times they are making projections on behalf of their customer base, and they may be taking the inventory into their house and holding it. And so that, you know, one thing I would encourage people to look at is if you're not working with what we refer to as a stocking distributor. So a lot of these distributors will say, hey, I, I understand Nick's business plan and I'm going to put that inventory up. Yes, I have to make an investment. But I, I believe in Nick's business and I'm going to make sure I have X number of weeks of supply as a buffer for him. He doesn't have to pay me for it until he takes it. Uh, but there are distributors who are willing to do this. We refer to them as stocking distributors. Um, but whether you're working with a stocking distributor or not, you know, pick their brain. Who are they getting the glass from? What's, what's the lead time? What are they seeing? Are they seeing capacity tightening? Are they seeing it easing? If they're delivering it, who's their carrier? Okay. Do you want to, do you want to look at maybe picking it up? Um, you know, though that could also be, you know, a cost play on your part to maybe, uh, you know, trim a few points of margin, but, but, but learning their logistics, learning what they are up against will allow you to provide information to them that should, again, make this supply chain as we look at these links, you know, you to the distributor to the glass company, <clears throat> you know, we're trying to eliminate the uncertainty um, in each link of the chain. And so the information that you learn they need and then that you can then provide simplifies all this. And hopefully uh, there are, there will still be ripples, but hopefully the, uh, the amplitude of the spikes is uh, significantly reduced. Yeah, it sounds like a really intensive process. And in the military, we called it intelligence, right? So I feel like that's doing that, right? Intelligence briefings on a daily basis. That's pretty amazing. Um, speaking of um, military intelligence, Nick, uh, what have you and Travis you know, learned? How is Hotel Tango getting creative with this crisis? Um, well, yeah, thanks. I'll have to, I think I'm going to have a Mike Pence moment with this fly that keeps buzzing around. So that's going to be really exciting. But um, no, one of the things that uh, I'll answer that first, but just a quick follow up on what Peter said too, that one of the changes we implemented um, early on that a lot of smaller producers or startups don't think about is this idea of like days on hand and true inventory management. So it was a lot of gut instinctual kind of, um, you know, planning and processing early on. And then to really look at stuff through the lens of a true inventory specialist or through that lens really made a big difference. And it's like, hey, with bourbon, you know, 30 days on hand for us could be 5,000 cases and with our cherry liqueur, it might only be 500. So just instead of saying, hey, we have to have some blanket amount of 
cases or inventory or barrels or whatever you're trying to manage, um, really, you know, taking that extra step and setting up the system to manage it was a big help to really help us understand, you know, what does 30 days on hand, what is the movement on this or what is 90 days so you can do what Peter's talking about and really make some solid projections and yeah, there'll be a little bit of movement, but hopefully your delta between your plan and your actual uh, is minimal and something you can overcome with some quick, you know, conversations with the right size partner or whatever. So that was something that just stuck out to me when, because uh, it seems second nature now, but I know in years, you know, three or four, we didn't have that process in place. So depending on who's watching and what stage of the game you're at. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we've learned is really the backup plans before you need them. Um, you know, and talking about Peter saying, do it this afternoon, like I definitely agree. You can't assume that anything is bulletproof. So even when you're in a good scenario and labels and boxes and what have you and barrels all seem to be solid supply, make sure that there's someone uh, in house that's looking at what's the backup plan if blank happens or what if this you know supplier completely closed or got bought and no longer wants to work with someone at our scale so having those backup plans in place instead of having to do the oh crap scramble when you find that information out and you know you still want to have a two week lead time on your wholesalers so that they don't suffer out of stocks uh, and you're not scrambling around looking for that person so that would be a big one for me i'm um, just making sure you're working on backup plans for the backup plans before you need them. Um, and then I'll caveat all this with saying, I'm kind of translating for our team because uh, with the position I'm in, we're, I'm a little insulated from the day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, we're really lucky we have a production and an operations team that's um, taken on a lot of these challenges and they deal with a lot of this day-to-day. -day. Um, but as far as like from a, you know, a managerial standpoint, I would say making sure that there's some sort of a system in place for accurate inventory and forecasting and making sure that someone's thinking about uh, what happens, the what if scenario is the two big kind of lessons over the years, I would say. Yeah, it sounds like tough times make tough brands. So certainly any of the brands that make it through what's happening right now are, are going to be here for a while, hopefully. Um, follow up question, Nick, tell us about shortening the supply chain. How is that? How has it helped out Hotel Tango bringing some of the supply chain home? Uh, well, I mean, most, it feels good mostly to tell people that, you know, you're getting your, uh, you've brought your supply chain into the state of Indiana. So that felt good for us to s just say they're coming stateside. Uh, it hasn't come without its challenges and then I'll answer why it helped. But the one, um, the one other lesson, I had a note and I forgot to say it, that we learned um, in that process of going custom, which is a little counterintuitive to what Peter said was, uh, making sure there's a quality control system in place too, uh, because as excited as we were to get those new Hotel Tango bottles that we owned and no one else had, and we had our supply locked up, uh, we'll then come to find out uh, it wasn't a perfect mold and it was giving us a little bit of issues with our cork. So thankfully, again, we have a good partner. We were able to go back and redo it, but that uh, not having that um, quality control component in place right up front uh, did cause us a little bit of disruption that we had to overcome. And I think we ended up putting, you know, 30,000 bottles out into the market that um, had really tight fitting corks that caused, you know, just challenges or potentially changed people's perception of our brand. Uh, if it's the only experience they've ever had with Hotel Tango. So, um, but uh, what was your second question? What was the question? <laughs> no, no, that, that was, that was it. I think that was the, that was sort of the, uh, the experience I was looking for. And any, I mean, the thing is, I think you're trying with the black corks, right? That went into the Hotel Tango bottles. Yes. Um, when you got past the cork, the product was great. So it, it didn't bother me too much. But getting it back, I think, was was quite a You a just challenge. had to drink the whole bottle in one go. I mean, that yes, was... exactly. That's, that's, that was the only option I was left with, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, but that was that's really interesting stuff. Um, and I also think it makes brands look at other opportunities, right? So that brings us to this disruption in getting brands to, to source different products. And some of these solutions are actually feeding nicely into helping brands achieve sustainability goals. Um, and there's even new concepts such as upcycling. So Clara, tell us about the role in, in forward plays with, with sustainability goals, uh, achieving those. And the really cool thing, I think, which is upcycling. 
So Amphor is a family owned company. So they've always had a strong sense of responsibility um, to environmental sustainability and then uh, responsibility to the workers as well and their customers. So it's really a, a bigger concept of social responsibility. So one of the things we're most proud of at Amphora is um, even before the pandemic started, but more so now uh, that we're having labor shortages, uh, we've developed a program for women with children. And what that does is it allows women that have small kids that go to school to drop the kids off at school and then come to the factory and maybe put in a short shift, put in six hours, and they would get off in time to go pick up their kids from school. So the, the kids you know, have a family member home with them. And what, what we found is that these women that are able to do this program that maybe they, they couldn't have got a good job somewhere else because of their family um, responsibilities is that they're more dedicated, we get better output, and we, we just have an all around good workforce of, of these women that have children. So I think that that's one of the things that we've done to really give back to the community, um, the local community, uh, along with competitive wages, uh, access to, to healthcare, social security, that a lot of these people in the, the small town in Pachuca, nobody's heard of Pachuca, um, you know, that these people wouldn't have access to. Some other things that we've done, uh, uh, we recently purchased a kiln from Lennox, uh, the factory that closed in the US. And we took this kiln apart in the US, we hired local workforce, took the whole thing apart and brought it back to um, Anfora in Mexico and had it put back together. And so that kiln, that couple ton kiln was going to end up in a landfill somewhere. And that was a kiln actually that was used to decorate China for the White House, so a piece of history. So now, We've saved that from the kiln, we've given people jobs, we brought it back to, uh, to Anfora, and now we're increasing our capacity um, during a time when capacity is short, uh, just by, by that one simple move. And then other things that we do, uh, we buy local within a 300 mile radius of the factory. And then also, um, you know, we've talked about shipping and the problems with shipping. Well, Amphora is in Mexico, so you're not, you're not incurring the same carbon footprint to go, you know, send on a container from, from China. So uh, just all in all, I think it's a lot better option and a lot more uh, socially responsible. And then as far as upcycling goes, Michael, uh, you know, to be honest, ceramic bottles aren't as, um, they don't break down the way you might think that they, they came from the earth, they're gonna go back to the earth. That With the firing process, it really it really doesn't lend to, you know, throwing a bottle into a landfill and having it break down. So what we do is we have some contacts that we can put our customers in contact with that do upcycling. So some, some artists in the US that you can ship the bottle to and they can turn it into a lamp. They can turn it into candlesticks, uh, many different options. And you know, th that's just where we're starting right now. That's the first thing we've really looked at. And, and that works great for a lot of our customers. I mean, most of our customers you know, aren't drinking three bottles of tequila a month and you know, running out of ideas. But, but for now, I think we're, we're going the upcycling route. Uh, and then at the factory itself, we also have a line, uh, a big line of dinnerware that we produce a lot for the US market. And so about 20% of all the, um, the QC rejects uh, are then ground down and added back into the, um, the process for the, the clay for the bottles. So those end up going into the bottles. So I, I think, you know, we're trying to look at it from every angle and, you know, if we can't be as, you know, recycle, the bottles aren't as re recyclable as we'd like them to be, what else can we do? What other things can we look at to give back to the community? And, and everything. Yeah, I think one of the things you hit on there, which is really interesting, and people don't think about it, it's not just about sourcing material, but the key part in operations and the key part of making you through all these challenges is investing in your people. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that I think will pay dividends, certainly for Amphora and any other company who has, who has done that. So that's really great to hear. Um, let's talk, uh, Peter, about the supply chain crisis and some of these pivots that have brought on, brought on uh, positive sustainability um, efforts for brands. What are you seeing from the wholesaler's perspective? Sure. I think uh, some of the things that we are seeing is because of the shortages and of course the push on sustainability, people are looking at the alternative containers. And if you look at say, I'll, I'll stick with wine. A traditional wine bottle was typically 20, 21 ounces of glass. You know, to make it to make a bottle, um, 
And, you know, Europe for, geez, I'll even say decades now, you know, they've been working with 13 and 14 ounce bottles. But as Americans and as our marketing machines, we didn't like what they looked like on the shelf. They were shorter, they were thinner, they were narrower. And, and, and so everybody was very concerned about, oh my gosh, you know, the, the shelf setting doesn't look the same, that won't work. Well, then it changed, right? Because <clears throat> to, to use 13 ounces of glass in a bottle is economical to the glass plant. It uses less glass. And therefore, I can, out of that same tank, I can get more bottles of glass, so it improves productivity. And then, as, we, as I said, I have a lighter weight container that I am now shipping all the way through the supply chain. Okay, so if I use an empty case of glass at 20 ounces a bottle, okay, that's two pounds, excuse me, you know, that's more than two pounds. That's, uh, that's 320 uh, ounces, you know, so that's almost 20 pounds just of glass. Okay, if I, if I take, you know, almost 30%, 40% of that weight out, okay, I'm now shipping 12 or 13 pounds of glass, okay? And, you know, it's just like everybody is, as we're paying $5 a gallon for gas, we're saying, hey, I don't need as much of, you know, I don't need to haul as much stuff around in my car, in my trunk. I can lightweight, I can get better gas mileage. And, and so we have, a you know, an impact to sustainability right there, um, just in terms of being more fuel efficient um, in our hauling. So lightweight glass is a big one. Um, and that, of course, pays us dividends as it leaves, um, you know, the winery and goes out to market as well. So I think that that is really good that we have used this, call it this crisis, to accept um, some sustainability benefits that we were not um, looking at before. <clears throat> um, one of the things, you know, I applaud Nick, you know, for, for sourcing domestically. And Clara, you're right, you know, I'd rather bring something out of Mexico than China. Um, but I think that that's the other thing is, you know, for so many years, it was cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness. And, you know, if you could save a dime on a bottle and bring that in from China instead, we, we were, everybody was doing it, right? Here, here's a very interesting statistic of, in terms of part of the reason why we're in this glass crisis is that about, um, I, I went in the mid 90s. So let's just say, 24, 25 years ago, there were over 100 glass plants in the United States. Okay. I think the count um, in, the, in the past recent years is we're down to 46. Okay. So why do we have 46 glass plants? Well, it's like everything else, right? We don't make a CD player. Not that anyone uses a CD player, but we don't make a CD player in the United States. Okay, we, 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 we've let these businesses go to other areas of the world. And I think, you know, again, we've all recognized here's a benefit of some of these supply chain crises is that we, we, we should be doing more sourcing here. Um, yes, I may be able to save a dollar or whatever the number is, but the number of jobs we lose, the, the flexibility we lose, <coughs> uh, it, it really becomes a problem. And so, you know, I would really encourage people where you can make commitment to domestic suppliers or North American suppliers. So let's include America or include Canada and include Mexico. You know, let's try to do that. Let, let's 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 keep it domestically. We're helping, you know, the, the supply chain. We're helping the environment. Uh, and it really makes a lot of sense for us to do that. Um, and likewise, with sustainability, you know, I mentioned um, where are we where can we source domestically? But again, look at how is that product, that where, how is it being shipped to you? Okay, it, are there ways for you to work with that carrier and find, you know, a more environmentally friendly way? And by that, I'm saying, are you dedicating a truck to yourself and it's only ten pallets? Well, is there a way for them to put somebody else's order on that? Um, do you have other neighboring? And they may be competitors, but, you know, at the same time, we're all in this together. You know, can you can you pool your loads with somebody else and share the freight and just drive the efficiency uh, of how we use freight um, to get that product to you? That'd be the other thing that I would encourage people to do. Yeah, those are those are all great tips. Bring the supply chain home. And we're seeing that now, even with the chip manufacturing and semiconductors. Right. Uh, you know, huge investment that's about to go through uh, Congress. Uh, but I think these are all lessons learned. And to your point, a lot of these things were, were self-created, but obviously exacerbated by the, the pandemic. And we're going to have to work our way out of it. Uh, Nick, let's go to you. 
what uh, does the future look like for Hotel Tango Distillery from a product standpoint, given what you've learned from the current marketplace challenges? Um, so we are going to continue to push our whiskey portfolio really out into the markets we're in and, uh, you know, maybe selectively add a few more as we continue to grow. Uh, one thing we've learned is, uh, you know, narrowed focus, you know, aim small, miss small. So uh, we'll have our three tasting rooms in Indiana and continue to supply those and have our, uh, you know, a wider portfolio, I would say here. But as we get bigger, we're going to try to uh, distill our portfolio down a little bit and to just really focus on the brown spirits. That's what's um, working for us uh, and what the consumers want. So we're going to continue to lead with our bourbon and our rye. Uh, we got a reserve and then we've added a flavored whiskey to the portfolio, my shameless schmallow plug. Um, but we'll continue to uh, continue to innovate in brown spirits. Um, we're prepping for um, a big Series C kind of capital raise to help give us a little bit of, uh, or a lot of bit of resources to really start like a marketing push and get the brand in front of some new consumers and see if we can turn our, uh, drive our 25,000 nine liters and turn it into 100,000 over the next three or four years is really the big goal for us, like kind of over the rainbow. And then uh, operationally, as it relates to this, we're in site selection for uh, what like an over the rainbow destination distillery location might look like in and around Indy. Uh, we're going to hit our uh, capacity at some point in the short term. So we got to think through what that looks like and how we can uh, move some operations or potentially some stuff we're outsourcing in house, you know, minimize the carbon footprint there to Clara's point, see what we can, you know, reuse, reduce and recycle, uh, whether it be taking in the barrels and putting new spirits in them and innovating that way or uh you know our glass partner too will take back uh rejects or broken and you know turn them back into new bottles so just some stuff like that and is there a way we can uh you know continue to be a, a socially responsible distillery and help kind of put indy on the map for a, a bourbon producing region um and then we too are uh you know, we're smaller, so it's a little harder to have like great employee benefits packages because that's expensive as well. But uh, we have added a, you know, a really solid uh, HR uh, executive over the last, I, I guess she came on board two years ago, but one of her big initiatives is just to looking at, all right, given the size and our scale, how can we improve our workplace uh, and make sure we can attract talent and make sure we have the right uh, benefits in place, whether it be, you know, childcare in-house or work from home days for mothers or uh, you know, all the various number of, uh, I don't know, benefits, I guess, an employee expects today, and we want to be able to provide from them. And then how does that relate to our diversity and how does that relate to the ESG and carbon footprint and all that? So, um, yeah, there's a, there's definitely no shortage of things to work on, but a uh, long story short to answer your question, it's just, you know, uh, continue running and servicing our, our home market here and then trying to grow the whiskey brand out into the, uh, some of our other markets and keep telling the story. Yeah, that's great. I mean, as a WWA Access Craft Brand member, seeing you approach this and Travis approach this from a holistic standpoint, uh, you know, following the consumer, investing in your people, investing in your portfolio and developing things and taking chances of being creative, I think has lent uh, to your success currently and certainly will pay dividends into the future. All right, now is a time where we take questions from those of you um, in attendance. We have a few that are, are creeping in on the, uh, the chat. So I'm just gonna pick one at random. Um, so basically we have here is one from uh, Jason Horrigan. Uh, Jason Horrigan asks, are distributors willing to carry additional finished good inventory to mitigate supply chain disruptions? And what type of conversation should we be having with our distributors. Peter, that may be best for you. Yes, Jason, and I, I'm going to assume that you mean by the my my current organization, you know, the, the 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 alcoholic beverage distributor as opposed to the glass distributor. And I'm going to say yes, you know, we we are willing. But, you know, let let's let's remember, right? We are we are putting our money out there. And so as we talk to people, we want to make sure you have solid business plans that I am not taking on all the risk. Okay, so for example, some of you may or may not be able to afford this, but but can you offer us payment terms? Okay, obviously we're not looking about, you know, at, at consignment inventory, that's against the law, 
but you know rather than you know pay with a normal 10 or 30 day cycle you know is there a way you know to to stage the payment cycle um, you know so that you know some of that risk remains yours even though i may have taken that inventory um, into my into my house or into my warehouse uh, so yes we are we are open we are creative and again i would encourage everybody out there to think of ways like that you know so it's you're not asking the distributor to take on all the risk. Okay, once you've shipped it, you know, you're done. No, we don't want it to be that way. We, we really need to look at a supply chain is based on a partnership. And so how do you work that and how do you balance the risk between both partners? Yeah, I think that's the key term, right? Uh, partnership. Uh, and that's, I think, the good approach um, for any uh, supplier producer working with a, a, a distributor on anything. It's a, it's a partnership. Uh, next question is from Jan Katowski Chang. Uh, can anyone speak to aluminum and the best practices in securing as the can wine and RTD category is exploding? And, um, you know, shout out to our beer friends who are, you know, uh, I think advocating and really trying to solve the, the tariffs issue, right, with aluminum. So can anyone speak to that? What's what's the situation with aluminum cans given the RTD and can wine category needing more um, sources? Michael, I'll take a quick shot at it. Um, at one point, uh, I was involved in the aluminum markets. The tough thing here about aluminum cans is even though you can buy them globally, <clears throat> uh, you're shipping a lot of air. Okay. And so, you know, again, we're going back to this whole transportation thing and you're basically moving a truck full of air uh, from point A to point B. So uh, my, my read on this, it's really about the, the can producers putting more capacity, you know, into North America. I think everybody has seen, especially now with wine, you know, both wine and uh, the spirits, cocktails and cans, it's, it's the demand for cans is through the roof. <clears throat> okay. So again, decorating is the slowest part uh, of, of built of making a can. They can make cans much quicker than you can decorate them. So those of you who've already, Hey, I'm buying just silver cans and I'm labeling them somewhere else. Again, that is a, uh, uh, you know, a great step. Uh, you know, but I think that really right now it, you're, you are at the mercy of the large packaging organizations and, and their willingness to to invest um, in, in a can plant. Um, so that's uh, I know that's not an answer anybody wanted to hear, but but that's quite frankly, that's what we're limited by the ability to make cans. Anyone else have anything to add to that? OK. Uh, we have two questions here from Dan uh, Krynan, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to combine both of them, I think. But, you know, this seems like it's really time intensive. So it seems like Dan probably comes from a, a craft brand, uh, feels like he's, she's been spending a lot of time selling and, and you know, getting the product orders generated. Uh, but it, he's a little intimidated, I think, because he's hearing that he has to learn a lot, keep a lot uh, in mind in terms of the um, supply chain and, and making sure materials are showing up for production. So how much time should a craft brand uh, be spending every week meeting with their operations team, Nick, uh, meeting with you know, their distributor, uh, meeting with their, their glassware and bottle provider? Um, how much time should you take every week? Is this a daily check-in, a weekly check-in? What's the, what's the tempo for people? Uh, I mean, I'll take a stab at it. I, again, I'm not going to pretend I know exactly the hour spread that, you know, our director or the VP of ops is spending on it. I can take a pretty good stab at it, but I know uh, for us, what's worked is that's the first thing we do each week is we check in with all the departments and we compare forecasts and actuals versus, you know, what we have on hand and what does a production schedule look like. So I would definitely say, however you cycle your timelines, whether that's something you want to do at the beginning of each work week or at the end of each work week, I would spend a, a more significant amount of time on it uh, and potentially cross departmentally just to make sure that there's, uh, you know, not surprises happening later that no one's on a different page than the operations team. Cause ultimately if you don't have uh, the supply, you know, going out and trying to get orders uh, doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you can't fulfill them. And then from there, I would say whoever is uh, potentially the point person or overseeing that uh, definitely needs to be 
uh, at least a daily check-in. I don't know that there needs to be daily, um, you know, modifications made and whatnot. That might be a beginning end of week kind of thing. If I was just setting up a new department, just to be frank. Um, but, and then the last thing I would say is we spent a significant amount of time on the front end, specifically with our whiskey production, because there's so many, uh, it's a, it's a giant algorithm of when you make it and how long it has to age and where those barrels are and when you dump them and what they become and how much you charge. Um, so we did. And if you don't have the capability in-house, I would look for someone third party that could help you build uh, kind of the master spreadsheet that hopefully sort of just self feeds itself. And then once you have uh, invested that time on the front end on kind of putting the model in place, if you can get it to where it's a, a self uh, updating self feeding model so you're only changing a few uh, variables that would be the biggest suggestion and uh, honestly we looked around uh, and there's a couple programs you know uh, currently we're using whiskey systems on the back end just being honest but uh, there's a few systems that do some of that but we couldn't find the one that did it exactly what we were looking for with us having barrels in different locations and different age profiles so we ended up kind of having to frankenstein our own thing in an excel format and uh we're just we're living off that now but you know we spent ugh, i mean on and off i mean weeks all in and i bet once you put the hours together over a year probably building the system out so i don't know if that makes you feeling better but uh it's definitely it was worth it once we got there is what i would say anyone have anything to add to that I'll just add real quickly, uh, you know, Dan, I think that everything Nick mentioned is very important. The other thing is um, that I would really encourage you to put time into is <clears throat> if tomorrow you call whoever your supplier is and they can't get you what you need, that's the, that's, that's, you need to have plan B ready. Okay. And, and that, so I would, I would encourage you, Nick, I don't know if you would call it, you know, a, a disaster plan or, or what, you know, but, but, but if your packaging, for whatever reason, isn't available tomorrow, what are you doing? You know, you don't have three weeks to say, oh, my gosh, let me get alternatives. Let me evaluate them. Let me see if this will fit on my bottling line. Do I have the chains parts? Will my cork fit? Will the labels work? You need to have that ready. OK, and so that, I guess that to everybody out there, I would say, <clears throat> and those who know me, right, I'm all about logistics and the planning. And, you know, I love that stuff for whatever reason. <clears throat> but if you don't have plan B ready of what you're going to put your product in tomorrow, it doesn't matter how good all those logistics were, you know, so that that's, so I would get your disaster check what your, what your next package is. If your thing isn't available, isn't available or call Clara and say, Hey, I'm going to ceramic in the short term because I don't know what I'm going to do long term. So call Clara. She's probably got some stock things available for you. Okay. And <clears throat> be ready with that. Okay. If I have a business interruption, what am I going to do? Then you, so at least you have that ready and then build a lot of the things Nick said. And if you then begin to look at that plan monthly and just adjust what's going on with your sales, what's going on with your new products, what's going on with lead times, then it becomes a much lighter lift, you know, once a month. But, but yeah, you got to put the, you got to put the time in up front. And, um, you know, I, I would just hope you don't need it. Uh, but if you need it, boy, you're going to be real glad you have it. In, in sort of like building on what Peter said, for anybody who's just, you know, maybe they're they're starting out right now on on you know building their craft brand, or maybe they're they're looking to do special releases. Um, like you said, Peter and, and Nick too, you can't plan too far ahead. Um, I mean, really, we want people to come to us that are ready to launch next year. I mean, you you want to spend the time you want to give it the right amount of time. I mean, you want to work with a designer, there's going to be back and forth. And now we've got, you know, the, the issues with the supply chain. So, so really just, if you think it's going to take six months, if you need your product in six months, you should be starting, you know, 12, 18 months ahead of time, you know, to work if you're, if you're going to do ceramic and probably the same with glass too, especially if you're going to do something custom, because it's going to take time. It's going to take more time than you think. Yeah, those are all, all good insights. Uh, we have a question from someone who's anonymous, and they're asking, is it acceptable or will it be acceptable with the uh, glass shortages to switch to plastic bottles? 
and I will I will add to that. What about like the uh, the Tetra packaging and alternative? <laughs> Uh, look, there. there's a, a major, very large whiskey producer uh, that did that last year, right? They couldn't get glass, and so they went to plastic. Uh, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's acceptable. The question is, is it acceptable to you as the brand owner? Okay, is that the image? Um, and is it, is it worth taking a potentially a short-term hit to your image um, versus being out of stock? Um, you know, so I think it's a very, you know, it is subjective. Uh, look, I, if you're asking this consumer's opinion, if I see one of my favorite products in plastic, I would probably say, oh, what happened? Um, when, I, when I met Clara a couple of weeks ago, I said, oh my gosh, I, I, I found one of my favorite products and they had used a ceramic package. And I was like, how cool is that? I actually thought that was neat. It was a limited, they put it out there as limited edition and collector's item. And being, you know, knowing what I know, I, I said, I, I doubt that, but boy, that's great marketing. Um, and everybody else thought it was great marketing too. I was the only one that said, here's what's really happening. Okay. But so I would say, you know, I, I personally would rather see you look at something cool and neat and unique rather than just going to a PET bottle, but, but please, that's one consumer's opinion. And I am hardly a, uh, you know, a market sample worth using. So, but that's my two cents on the topic. Yeah, I would just add, I think uh, acceptable if, if there's sales and you're going to miss out and people are asking and there's demand, then absolutely. Uh, you know, we're intrigued by um, some of the Tetra and paper based stuff. That's I didn't want to chip in on the aluminum thing, because even though we have some brewers, great, great brewers on our distilling team uh, that know a lot about it, we've kind of avoided going down that path. And I'm more intrigued by some of the other uh I don't know, potential new packaging that's coming around and seeing what that looks like. But I would, I would echo Peter and say, is it on brand uh, kind of for what you want to put out would be the biggest question. Yeah, no, those, that's, uh, that's, all, that's all good as well. Um, we have another question from Angela Evans. How should we plan for the 700 ml glass coming to the US as an approved container as early as next year? What will be the challenges as well as opportunities? That's a toss well, I guess I'll take that one again. <laughs> uh, look, I'm glad the United States government uh, approved this. I think that it's going to be quite interesting. I, I What I don't like about this as a distributor is uh, if you convert to 700 ml, don't go back to 750. Okay, that, that now you're going to make me you're going to make me crazy if you go back and forth. You need to pick a size and stick with it. Because obviously we're talking about, you know, especially if you're going to the on-premise, all right, everybody looks at cost per ounce, cost per glass, okay, how many glasses are in a bottle, okay, and I'm not going to get out of a 700 what I get out of a 750, okay, so all these pricing decisions just, just create complexity, you know, all the way through, you know, a company like Breakthrough Beverage. Um, in addition, now your palette pattern is changing. Okay, where I store, um, you know, Breakthrough Beverage and some of our competitors, we have um, <clears throat> we have automated storage and retrieval equipment. So basically, what that means is we have robots that put things away and retrieve them and pick them. Okay, so now I've got to reprogram those. I've got to I got to find new places to store it. So <clears throat> we're okay if you want to do it, do it. That's great, but don't go back. Okay, that that's the one thing is you need to make a clean cut and not be in 750s for part of the year and 700s for the rest of the year. And I would also encourage that you do it across your portfolio. Don't put your Chardonnays in 750s and your Cabernets in 700s. Again, it's just going to create, oh, was that a 750 or was that a 700? What's the cost per ounce on that? What's the cost? We, you know, we need to know what you are. Um, and so that's, uh, again, my, my advice regarding that topic. No, that's really good insight, Peter. Anyone have anything to share to, uh, or, or add to that? <clears throat> no? Okay. Well, um, listen, I, I think we, we definitely had a, a good discussion. This was a great webinar. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I wanted to thank those of you who attended today. Uh, and, and those of you uh, who are representing craft brands, startups, small production brands, uh, we know this has been a, a challenging time. 
Uh, but think about all the things that you've learned early on, right? You can either learn these lessons now or you can learn them less in it, uh, later. And sometimes it's better to learn these things now and make the adjustments and your business will be better for it uh, in the future. And certainly I think if anything, um, this industry has come together, it communicates more efficiently and more effectively, the planning process, um, the, the inventory process, the ordering process, a lot of positives have come from this, uh, this crisis and these continued disruptions. So I think together, We'll certainly make it through this and, and come out on the other side uh, a much better, stronger, and unified industry. So uh, I want to thank our panel today. Um, thank you so much for all of your time, for the preparation, for the, the knowledge, and um, the, the, the tips you've imparted on us today. I think it was great. Also want to thank our sponsor, Oracle NetSuite, for everything they do in the industry. Uh, a great partner to many in attendance. And also a reminder, this webinar will be recorded, made available both on the WWA Access Craft website, as well as uh, an email recap that you will receive if you registered and attended. Uh, all right, until next time, everyone be safe, be well. Have a great day.